The Garden of Truth by E. Nesbitt. He had been to South Africa and Canada, to Japan, Egypt, India and the Canary Islands, but he had never been to a hydropathic establishment, and the idea repelled him. He was in one regard a shy man. His mother was his only woman friend, and this not from any misogynistic streak, but from a certain clean reverence in him that made him set woman on a pedestal and leave her there, perhaps from an unconscious fear lest, seen closely, her divinity might not remain divine. Visions of pretty girls, beautifully dressed, not to be avoided, living in the same house with him, breaking in on a reserve that he kept to himself the right to break, some day, for the one woman when he should meet her. These revolted him. His mother was not wholly to be trusted in these matters. She had shown before now a disposition to invite nice girls to the house and throw them at his head, a want of tact excusable in her, for he was the heir to estates, and to a name too honoured in the past to be allowed to leave the future blank of it. He felt, in face of the hydropathic establishment, like a wild creature in face of a trap. Yet the thing, trap or no trap, had to be faced. His mother insisted. "'I am right sometimes, even if I am your mother,' she said. "'If you had only consulted me, this would never have happened. "'Wild duck, indeed!' "'I've often laid out all night before,' said he, "'and taken no harm. "'Not when you'd just come back from India,' she said. "'An open boat, and on those nasty swampy broads, "'enough to give you rheumatic fever fifty times over.' I should get strong much sooner at home here with you, he pleaded, adding, in point of fact, I'm perfectly well as it is. My dear, you're my patient. I've nursed you through it, and now we must complete the cure. Dr. Sutton has just the place. You remember him when you were a little boy. He used to cut figures out of turnips for you. And a pretty figure I shall cut, a strong, healthy, beef-eating chap among all the muffled-up old invalids. I don't suppose they'll all be old, said the mother, or all muffled. And he shuddered. And what you want is building up. It's quite settled. Because you see, dear, if you don't go, I shan't go, and the doctor says I want a change. This settled it, and they went. That hydropathic establishment perches in a high hollow between moor and valley and blinks with its many windows at the rising and the setting sun. It knows the ecstasy of the free wind in its face and the quiet, sheltered peace of great gardens about its feet. The young man admitted, as the carriage turned in at the lodge gate, that the place was not half bad. The gardens are like a romantic landscape, like a watto he said, all those lakes and statues and weeping willows. The house is beautiful too, she said. It was old Lord Pentland's place, and when he died they sold it. The drive curving brought it into view. It's like an Italian palace, isn't it? It was. Its long, white, many-windowed facade stood up flat-roofed from piled terraces that led by curved steps to the rose garden. The invalid looked in on it all and saw that it was good. Also, he greatly desired the hour of dinner, for he was healthily hungry. It was the mother who, at the last moment, was too tired to go down to dinner, and was served in her own room at a western window, looking down on the age-old bowling green. "'It is pretty. I am enjoying myself so much,' she told him when he came up after dinner. "'Yes, of course, smoke, dearest. You know I like you too. "'And tell me, what were the people at dinner like?' "'Just exactly like other people,' he said. "'Except the woman opposite me, a sort of nun by her dress. "'She had a face like a hatchet of the flint age. "'And the girl who was with her... "'Was the girl hatchety too? "'My dear mother, I wish you'd seen her.' You will tomorrow, of course. It's something for you to live for. She's the most beautiful person I've ever seen. 
tall and dark, and the loveliest eyes, and her face like a wild rose. An artificial rose? the mother asked. You'll see tomorrow. Did you speak to her? she asked, well knowing that he had not. No, he said. Couldn't have if I'd wanted to. Her duenna would have seen to that. But she spoke to me, asked me for the salt, her voice like a dream. I expect you and she will be great friends, was the mother's next move, a false one. Oh, no, he said. I'm content to admire at a distance. But do you think you'll like being here? Oh, I shall like it all right enough. He was awakened next morning by the flood of the June sunshine and the sound of a gong. While the valet moved about his room, he lay a moment turning over the cud of remembrance. Ye gods, what a dream, he said. And when his mother asked him how he had slept, he said, Like a top. But I dreamt. <sighs> by Jove, I haven't dreamt so distinctly since I was a kiddie. I dreamt about that girl. What did you dream? Ugh, the most romantic nonsense. Serenades under her window and so on. All sorts of wild stuff. As he spoke, his words sounded in his ears a treason and a sacrilege. For his dream had been this. He dreamt that he awakened in his room of the hotel and lay looking at its unfamiliar lines, at the shadowy depths of curtain, the shape of the window and its panes lying traced in moonlight on its floor. And so real was the dream that at first he thought it to be a real awakening. It was only afterwards that he perceived it to be a dream. He lay there looking at the moonlight and presently got up and went to the window to look out at the romantic landscape, painted in grey and white and black. The winding walks along massed shrubberies, the willows drooping over statues and busts, the fountains set in smooth grey sward. He saw all the garden in his dream as plainly as he had seen it in yesterday's waking hours. More plainly, for now he noticed things that afterwards he could not remember to have before observed. That white-pillared temple, reminiscent of the Temple of Love in the gardens of the Trianon, the waterfall looping silvery down the hillside. The night was breathlessly warm, and the garden beckoned. He went out through the French windows onto a little stone balcony with a flat balustrade. He was quite reasonable and thoughtful in the dream. He meant to get to the garden, to wander in its cool shadows and across its moon-whitened glades, but he did not mean to run any risks of catching cold. So reasonable was he that he put on flannels and a sweater. Also, he did not mean to disturb the house. Therefore, he did not go out through doors and passages, opposed by chains, bolts and locks, but climbed down from his balcony by the help of the giant wisteria that knotted itself there, set foot on the terrace and walked away quietly under yew trees which curved and clipped made a dark archway. Stone itself had not been darker. Through this he came out into the garden. The garden was very large, very beautiful. It seemed that he walked there happily for a long time before sleep began to draw near, caressing him with promises of rest. He turned towards the house and was near enough to be gazing up at its noble front before the doubt stung, sudden and sharp like a whiplash. Which was his window? The one with the balcony, obviously. Yes, but there were at least half a dozen windows with balconies, and the deceitful wisteria wreathed each and all. So then he tried to remember how the landscape had looked from his window, and moved hither and thither, contemplating. The Temple of Love! Yes, just so it had seemed when he first gazed out upon it. It seemed in his dream to be extremely important that he should find his own window again, for as yet, you will understand, the dream had not begun to be really dreamlike. 
It began to be that, when he had scaled the selected balcony, surmounted the wisteria, and faced the window of his room, for he perceived that it was not his room. Its window was not a French window, but the ordinary English kind with a proper window sill. Someone was leaning out of it among scented stars of jasmine, someone with all the air of having a perfect right to be where she was. It was the girl of the table d'hôte, dressed in soft whiteness, with her hair, a heavy heap of it, coiled low. She spoke at once, amazingly. I'm so glad you've come, she said. And it was then that he knew it was a dream, for he dreamt that he loved her, and he had never loved a woman. I've been watching you in and out of the trees, she said. I wanted to come out too. But haven't you noticed if you try to make things happen in dreams, you wake up? So I just waited. I didn't know it was a dream, he said stupidly. I thought you looked so interesting at dinner, she said. Isn't it silly that in real life you mustn't speak to interesting people unless you've been introduced? Very silly, he said, and added, Have you been dreaming long? Conversationally, as one should say, Have you been to Paris lately? I always dream, she answered. Tonight I dreamt about old houses and a secret passage, and it led to a stable yard where they were harnessing a pair of griffins to a handsome cab, and I went through the door into the stable, and it was my room instead, and I went to the window and saw you. It feels just as if you were real. Only then we shouldn't be talking here like this, should we? He was very near her, and she was more beautiful thus seen. "'and she looked at him with eyes that he seemed to know very well indeed. "'I must have dreamt of you before,' he said. "'But it's I who am dreaming,' she said. "'Only I don't want to remember that or I shall wake up. "'I'd rather pretend it's real.' "'It's I who am dreaming,' he said. "'Perhaps she is dreaming the same thing. "'Only she can't know that.' "'Who?' The girl I'm dreaming about. Uh, you. The ordinary correctitudes are not demanded in dreams. She smiled at him with, as it seemed, all her heart in her eyes. May I touch your hand? he said. And in the dream it seemed the only natural thing to say. It may wake me. But she gave it. It was smooth and soft warm in the palm and chill at the slender fingertips. He held it gently. I think I wanted to speak to you at dinner, he said. And even after this I shan't dare. I shall see you tomorrow and you won't know me. It's you who won't know me, she said. Then he said, But suppose this were real. Yet, of course, unless... We shouldn't be here hand in hand unless we were... Lovers, should we? No, she said. That's why dreams are so beautiful. One hasn't to define things. You may wander in beautiful gardens and it's not trespassing. You may go through orchards and gather the fruit and it's not stealing. You may hold a hand like this and it's not forbidden. I often wonder who makes the rules, she said. I knew we should like each other the moment I saw you, but of course I couldn't say so there. So I said, may I have the salt? That really meant I like you very much. And I didn't say anything. And I think that must have meant I like you very, very, very much. I should like to stay here forever, holding your hand. I should like you to stay too, she said simply. But I want to kiss the hand. May I? He said. It was an unnatural dream, he thought, even then. Why not? She answered, still with a magnificent simplicity. So he kissed it. Then he let it go, and his arm lay close to hers on the window sill. Their eyes met, and the meeting was long, so long and so intimate that at last he moved to draw her to him. 
She drew back and breathed softly. No, no, not yet. There will be nothing left for next time. Suppose there never is a next time. There must be. And if there isn't, well, isn't a dream like this worthwhile, even if it should be the first and last? But you love me, he whispered. Oh, yes, she answered. And I'm so glad that you love me. And again their eyes met, and their hands, and the scent of the jasmine round her window was heavy and sweet in his dream. I shall never be able to tell you of this when I am awake, he said, and knew he spoke the truth. And I... Oh, I don't want to think of the other you, the real one, she said. This one is mine, isn't it? It is my dream, she insisted. When you wake up, then. If only this dream could last and we could stay here just as we are, always. How beautiful you are, and how very, very dear. I must have loved you all my life without knowing it. If only the dream could last forever, he whispered. If only it could, she sighed. It did not last another moment. It broke up in confusion, as dreams will. A voice called in the garden, disturbing its peace. There were lights, like big will-o'-the-wisps. Then the doctor and a nursewoman blundered into the dream. He shut his eyes, and when he opened them again, it was morning. And he was saying, Ye gods, what a dream! Do you wonder that he could not meet at breakfast the eyes of the lady with whom his dreams had taken such unwarrantable freedom? He saw that she was there, fresh and sweet as the morning. He saw the hands he had dreamt of holding in his, the heavy hair now piled high on the graceful head. Once, when that head was turned away, he glanced at her. Probably she was a quite ordinary young woman in real life. In real life they would probably have nothing in common. In the dream, though they had only spoken of love... He had not doubted but that their hopes, beliefs, aspirations would fit each other as the key fits the lock, as the sword fits the scabbard. He went out for a long, lonely walk over wide moors that soothed like sleep itself, and at dinner he kept his eyes for his plate. "'Sleep well last night?' the doctor asked him later. "'Splendidly. Any dreams?' You used to be a rare chap for dreams when you were a kiddie. Yes, I did dream. Rather remarkable dreams, as it happens. Ah, said the doctor. A change of air, perhaps. That night, the young man dreamt that he woke and tried to go out to the lady of his love. But there were bars to the window. In the morning, he noticed that there were sockets for screws at even intervals on the window frame. Evidently, there had once been bars. Odd that he should have dreamt of them. On the second evening, his mother, who had been busy making acquaintances, introduced him to the girl. They exchanged a few uninteresting words, and she was drawn away by the flint-faced aunt. He wondered afterwards if he had been too cold, too detached. She had looked at him, he thought, a little curiously. Had he in his anxiety not to let the dream too warmly colour reality, been more cold even than common courtesy? Well, it was better than the reverse would have been. He must be careful. If he saw much of her, he would remember the dream too vividly for safety. He must avoid her as much as possible in the day, and night might perhaps be kind and bring her to him in dreams. So day after day he avoided the lady and night after night he dreamt of the bars. He tried all sorts of measures to break this bar dream, took walks, took whiskey, went to bed early, went to bed late. In vain, it was always the same dream. But at length, the little excitement of the doctors being summoned to an urgent case twenty miles off at eleven o'clock at night, the helping to get out the motor because the men were all gone to bed, the tucking up in it of nurse and doctor seemed to break the spell. He dreamt that he woke, got up, and looked for the bars. They were not there. 
Then he dreamt that he dressed himself with hands that trembled and got out of his window and swung himself down by the wisteria. He stepped back, looking up at the house. Something moved on one of the balconies. It was she, leaning over through the wisteria and white-starred jasmine and reaching out her hands to him. Oh, she whispered, you've come, you've come. I thought you would never come again. I couldn't, he said. I've dreamt every night that there were bars to my window. I've wanted you so. Come down. Could you climb down? With a quick, assured movement, she seemed to rest her weight on the edge of the balustrade and to swing her feet up till they lay along it. Then she hung by her hands and dropped lightly to the ground beside him. These things are easy in dreams. They went away side by side over the dewy grass, in a silence that was not broken till they sat in the shade of a weeping willow on the steps of the Temple of Love. Then she leant her head against his shoulder, as if it were the most natural act in the world, and said, If I could go on dreaming of you sometimes, I shouldn't mind what happened. Only I wish I didn't have to see the real you in the daytime. You look at me then as if you hated me. Don't you see, he said, his arm round her shoulders, I hardly dare to look at you at all because I love you so. Not the real me? No. Yes. How am I to know which is the real you? What would that stately lady do if I went up to her in the morning light and said, Do you remember how I... He stooped and kissed her. You said it should be next time, he said hurriedly. What would that stately lady do if I were to say, Do you remember how I kissed you in the moonlight in my dreams? I don't know what she would do, but you will never say it. Why? Because you are in my dreams. Ha! Ah, but you're in mine. No. Yes. We can't know, that's the worst of it. We could, she said. I will wear a bunch of jasmine tomorrow. You put a jasmine flower in your coat, then we shall know. And if we've both dreamt it? But we haven't. I shouldn't be here like this if I thought the real you was dreaming about me. You see, as long as it's my dream, it's only me, and that's why I can say and do just what I like. I can speak the truth, as one can't do when one is awake. Nobody knows. But if the real you knew, how could I look at him again? You never do look at him. No. Look at me, he said. And when she had obeyed, that, he said, is how you could look at him if he had dreamt his dream too. Will you tomorrow? If I wear the jasmine flower? Ah, oh, if, she said. The quiet of the garden lay all about them. The grey moonlight turf blotted here and there with the shadows of the trees and water gleaming white, the statues showing ghostly among the groves. Dearest in the world, he said, whatever happens I can never love anyone else. Whatever happens I shall always love you. I'm going into a convent, she said. The real me, I mean. I was so tired and worried, and now, you see, I could never love anyone but you either, so I shall just take the vows and try to do some good. It's a nursing sisterhood. And suppose you dream of me when you are a nun. It's impossible, she said quite simply. When once I've taken the vows, I shall remember you as if you were dead, or as if I were. They sat long in the shadows, looking out over the grey-green slopes of dewy grass, talking of many things, without disguises and without concealments. It was a dream, and in it her head rested on his shoulder. His face lay against her hair. Suppose, he said at last, that this were not a dream at all. Suppose that you and I were really lovers, the real you and I. Suppose we were going to be married tomorrow. Tomorrow, she said, tomorrow my aunt is taking me away. But you'll wear the white jasmine, he urged. Yes, but it won't be any use. 
he does not remember going back to the house. But the next morning he remembers, most fully he remembers it. He came down to breakfast knowing that it had been his dream, and yet with a mad hope that it had been hers, into which he, in his, had entered. He looked almost with faith for the white jasmine at her breast, and she was wearing a red rose. But her eyes met his in a long pause of wonder, bewilderingly bewildered. She must guess that she was not a stranger to him. No, that was impossible, unless their dreams had rhymed, and that, in the crude light of ten in the morning, he felt to be impossible. Nevertheless, when he had lighted the after-breakfast pipe and strolled out into the garden, he paused by a tangled net of jasmine overgrowing a marble summer-house, plucked a starry spray and stuck it in his buttonhole. Then he went back to the terrace where she was sitting on a wicker chair by the hatchet-faced aunt, amid a group of demure tabby ladies. And he stood quite near her, and to someone else made a remark about the weather. Then, for the first time, out of dreams, she spoke to him of her own accord, raising her starry eyes to his. "'Your jasmine is beautiful,' she said. It was absurd of it, but his heart leapt to her words. "'Would you like some?' he asked, looking away from her for the old reason. "'Very much,' she said. I meant to gather some this morning, but somehow I didn't. I will show you where it grows, he said definitely. It grows by your window and mine, said her aunt, fussing. Oh no, she said, that is quite different. It is near enough, said her aunt. Go and gather some from your window if you want it. I want it very much, she said, and rose and went. He had just enough sense left to stroll off towards the rose garden. Once hidden from the terrace, he turned and ran back to the house. He stood by the foot of the stairs till he saw her coming down them with jasmine at her breast. "'You've got it, then. You're wearing it,' he said, knowing all the time how silly it was of him to say any such thing. "'Yes,' she answered. "'How sweet it is.' It has the scent of romance, he said. She looked at him. They were the eyes that had met his in dreams, but the dear blue of them was clouded with doubt. Then, do you ever dream? he said. The damask colour flooded her cheek, chin, neck. I dreamt of jasmine last night. The scent provokes dreams. It grows just outside my windows. I know it does, said he. And silence fell between them. Her eyes were downcast. Then suddenly he laughed harshly and turned away. <sighs> One imagines all sorts of unimaginable things in dreams, he said. I don't want to bore you, and your aunt will be worrying about you. Won't you tell me? She said. And her voice was the voice of the dream. About your dream? How can I tell you here? he asked. If the jasmine means anything to you, why didn't you wear it this morning? I did, she said. But when I saw you come in without it, I pulled mine out. It's under the dining room table now, I suppose. Then, he said, between confusion and triumph, Oh, she said, with the effect of sudden awakening, If I'm not mad, you are. This is nonsense we're talking, and I don't really know you at all. Don't you? he said. Don't you? Quick, I know a hiding place. The real you and the real me. We are here in the sunlight. Do you remember? Where? she said, breathless. The hiding place? And her eyes were the eyes of the hunted. The roof, he said. Quick! He held out a hand, she gave hers, and together they fled up the stairs and onto the flat, leaded roof with the marble balustrade. Am I to say it? he asked. Say what? What I said I should say. 
she looked at him. Fair as the morning, fearless as Diane. Yes, she said in level tones. Do you remember, he said slowly and firmly, how I kissed you last night in the moonlight of a dream? She hid her face in her hands. It isn't true, she said. It's this that's the dream. He stood still, not moving to touch her. You said you loved me, he said. When? In the dream. Our dream. Not yours or mine, but ours. In our dream in the Garden of Truth, you said you loved me. And I do love you, she said, and dropped her hands. But I'm mad for all that. This is the dream. Things don't happen like this. Yes, they do. Think of the Brushwood Boy and Peter Ibbotson. Those can't be just imagination. That's what happened to us. And you're mine, and I'm yours. Yes, she said, but those things don't happen to sane people. I'm not ashamed. It was a dream, and in dreams one speaks the truth. But I will never see you again. But I love you, he said, as though that settled everything. I know, she said, and I love you. We've got the dream. There shall never be anything else. Swift as a deer in flight, she left him. He heard the rush of her skirts on the turret stair. He did not follow her. All life was before him. He was able to hold back. His faith in her love commanded that he should let her test it. She should know what it was to renounce her dreams. That mood of detachment lasted perhaps five minutes. Then he, in his turn, swept down the stairs like a whirlwind and appeared on the terrace demanding, quite as one who had a right to know, where she was. Packing her boxes, said the aunt sourly, and retired, doubtless to pack her own. Wheels on the gravel announced arrival. The doctor had returned. I want to ask you something, the young man said as the doctor's boot touched ground. The doctor looked at him. Come into my den, he said, smiling, since it seems to be a matter of life and death. In the cool, book-lined room, which seemed to hold no sympathy with such stories, he told his tale. So, you see, we both dreamt it. And we're really awfully fond of each other, he said, with the awkwardness that convinces. And now she says sane people don't dream such dreams, and... He added on a note of despair, she's packing her boxes. The doctor rubbed his lip with a deliberate forefinger. The fact is, he said slowly, well, it'll all come right. Just court her in the ordinary way and forget all this dream rubbish. She's going into a convent, said the man whose dream she was. Oh, our friend the aunt, eh, said the doctor. Well... Well, that alters the case, certainly. All right, here goes. He got up and stood looking out of the window. The girl walks in her sleep, he said, and so do you. I've never known a case of a sleepwalker who could talk intelligibly while in a condition of somnambulism, but no doubt she's the exception. The fact is, you've both been walking in your sleep. Did you dream of bars, by chance? Night after night. Yes, you would. I put them up a nights after you'd gone to bed, took them down in the morning before you were up. After that first night, I thought it safer. You might have set Rick's afire or something. But last night I forgot them. I was called away, you remember? And so love's young dream found the appropriate setting, weeping willows, statues, yew hedges and the summer moon. The young man leant back, rigid, his mind searching his memory. Quite suddenly he smiled, and the tense muscles relaxed. Her walking in her sleep is no reason why she shouldn't be married, he said. Great Scott, no, said the doctor. Only if you still walk. You were a dreadful example of it as a child, I remember. It just shows that you and she are both rather nervous subjects. But I don't walk in my sleep 
the young man said slowly and surely. I haven't since I was eleven. The fact is, I see now, I wasn't asleep at all, and, well, doctors are like priests, and under the seal of the professional confessional, I can't deny it, it was the way she talked. You see, she was dreaming. I was awake all the time. I never thought I was dreaming till she began to speak to me. And she thought it was a dream, he repeated awkwardly. And I see, said the doctor, and I congratulate you. With that demon aunt on guard, you'd never have got a chance in this life, to say nothing of the girl being as shy as a moorhen. But in dreams, all things are possible. I congratulate you again. She's a bit of an heiress, too. I expect the aunt wanted her money for that sisterhood. She won't get it now. No, said the young man. I don't suppose she will. Not that that matters. I congratulate you for the third time, said the doctor. You really are in love. A matter of congratulation, you think? The doctor actually sighed. I too have been in Arcadia, he said. And if your dream is packing her boxes, etiquette demands that I should have a final professional interview with her before she goes. Would it inconvenience you to wait in the next room? The doctor rang the bell and gave his servant an order. She came to her lover, brave-eyed but rosy as the dawn. It appears that it's all my doing, she said, and neither of us is mad. Uh, therefore he ventured, and a little awkward silence fell between them. Dreams ought not to count, she said. Not your dream, or mine, he said, but our dream counts for everything. He says we walked in our sleep, she said. May our feet in waking take the same way, said he. And is it really you? she asked, and trembled a little. And wouldn't you like me more if I had pretended, if everything had been different? It's really you. And I, he said, and there can never be any pretending between us. We are past all that, and we've years before us. When we get bored and have nothing else to do, you can explain to me how I could possibly love you more. His mother thought the engagement a little sudden, but she is quite satisfied with the marriage. They are an ideal couple, she says. They seem to know each other so wonderfully well from the first. He understands her so perfectly, and she never misunderstands him. I really think they must have been made for each other. They think that, too.